With less than one week until the Olympics opening ceremony in Tokyo, officials have confirmed that a person in the athlete village has tested positive for COVID amid soaring cases that they're uh, there that have prompted residents to take to the streets. But the pandemic isn't the only point of protest. The International Olympic Committee has relaxed its longtime ban on athlete protests, allowing Olympians to make political statements before their events. But they will still be barred from any sort of activism from the medal podium, which is the site of perhaps the most famous Olympic protest when American sprinters John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their black gloved fists in the air in 1968. Still gives me chills to see that photo. One of those legendary activists himself joins us now, 1968 Olympic gold medalist Tommy Smith, who is the focus of this amazing documentary, Withdrawn Arms, as well as sports editor of The Nation, David Zarin. Dave is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Kaepernick Effect. Uh, gentlemen, very, very happy to have you here. Mr. Smith, I have to start with you um, and just have a bit of a fangirl moment. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that moment in 1968, because I doubt that, you know, at the time that would ripple through time and ripple through decades and still have such an impact on uh, on all of us today. I'm curious, given the uh, Olympic Committee rules that have come out, what are your thoughts on those? Time will always tell different tales of things that are true and untrue. It's up to the individual to pick out what side of the aisle you're going to be on, the right side or the right side. And here we're dealing with the right and we're dealing with right. Uh, one is right that man put into law. The other is right that your own self and your belief put into law. So uh, it's going to be interesting. In fact, uh, Nicole, is still, it is interesting. The athletes have a right now, uh, right through a lot of strife and a lot of sacrifice and a lot of uh, uh, decisive moments uh, in one's life, in one's athletic life, and, of course, in one's personal life. And it's interesting. Yes, it's going to be interesting. Sickness, yes, there is sickness and doubt. Yes, there is doubt. But there's going to be great competition and a good, the great alliance that the uh, IOC has kind of reckoned with uh, athletes are human, too. So maybe we better take a knee off their necks. And that's what's happening now a bit. And uh, I'm sure the athletes are very proud of it uh, because of the fight that has gone through so they can uh, implement their own decisive methods for moving forward under their own uh, impetus. Well, uh, I, very good point. I, the IOC has come a long way. Still a lot longer to go, I would argue. Um, Dave, you write about this in your latest piece for The Nation. I want to play this soundbite of the IOC president um, and see how he describes the people of Japan. Take a listen. And our common target is safe and secure games for everybody, for the athletes, for all the delegations, and most importantly, also for the Chinese people, Japanese people. Look, I, I do live TV. We all have a slip of the tongue every now and then. So I will give him a little bit of grace there. However, when you couple that with all of these other policies that really center whiteness, that really oppress some voices of color, you do have to scratch your head and say, really, guys, come on. But uh, curious what your take was here. Well, you said it really well. First and foremost, it's an honor to be on with Dr. Smith. I'm wearing my Olympic so Project great. Rights button. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if Tommy sees that, but that in honor of him, um, I, I think Thomas Bach, the reason why that quote unquote gaff has become an international incident and certainly front page news story throughout Japan is precisely because Thomas Bach is the most unpopular person in Tokyo right now. I mean, here he is bringing the Olympics to Tokyo. He's expecting to be greeted like some sort of imperial viceroy coming to town. But instead, he's talking to a city, 80 percent of the population of whom wants the Olympics delayed. Uh, the population as well is living under a state of emergency. You know, and they are looking at what's happening right now and asking themselves the question, would this be happening to us if the Olympics were being held in the United States or in Western Europe? Why is this being imposed upon us in a state of emergency and in a city that's overwhelmingly unvaccinated? I mean, you mentioned it at the start of the segment. Already we have um, uh, the first mini outbreak in the Olympic Village. Already the Nigerian delegation has also reported that they, they are having a mini outbreak. And these mini outbreaks can become very big, very quick. Quickly, and the people of Tokyo are not at, are not saying, "Yay, we get to host the Olympics." They're asking the question, "Why us?" Right. So I'm curious, Dave. Uh, given that, and given the the rampant COVID numbers, do you think that the Olympics should have been canceled? 
I think they absolutely should have been delayed to go in accordance with the will of the people um, of Japan. The problem is that the International Olympic Committee actually has more power over the people of Japan right now than the government does itself. When the government's been questioned, wait, 80% of this, of this major city that has 37 million people in the broader Tokyo area, you know, they want these Olympics to be at the very least postponed. Um, the answer is a shrug of the shoulders and saying, this is the IOC's call, not us. We have billions of, of dollars invested in this process. We'd be the subject to all kinds of lawsuits if this does not happen. The IOC is saying that its own organization and structure is not going to be able to move forward if it has to cancel the games again as they did last year and so that they i mean so they just feel like they're being used to keep the trains running on time right. instead of being should be which is a showcase for the great international athletes that we have throughout the world all right. Um, in the spirit of transparency, I'll, I'll let our viewers know we're having some uh, technical issues with uh, Mr. Smith and his camera. Um, still, we will still have him on our screen because I want you, Dave, to take a listen to this soundbite from his amazing uh, documentary that I hope everybody takes, a, uh, takes time to, to watch. Uh, take a listen to the soundbite and we'll talk about it on the other side. After that Olympics, it didn't just end with, oh, they got sent home. There was, he was ostracized from society. A lot of families have been hurt because they did less. Mothers and daughters and sisters and brothers have been beaten, lynched, or even worse because they were the color they are, not what they said. So yes, I regret that my family had to go through that, but there was no other way it could have been done. The sacrifice uh, that this man made. And I think we may have him back, Mr. Smith. I want to check and see if you can hear me. Um, yes, I can see. I can all hear. right. All right. Well, we just saw a clip of you uh, talk about what your family went through uh, after your protest. And I don't think enough people know those are the moments where it matters when you stand up and you have something to risk. And you did that. Um, so I'm just curious your advice to athletes now, like Gwen Berry, uh, who protested and, and held uh, up, up her uh, T-shirt during the playing of the national anthem. What's your advice to folks like that? Well, whatever you do, it's always going to follow you, no matter no matter who you are or what you say. You're going to have that little wagon that you're pulling around with all your misfit ideas. Uh, not that Gwen's was misfit, but ideas of anyone uh, that uh, does something which they really believe in. Uh, that is a responsibility of a person who uh, is uh, uh, doing the talking that uh, it doesn't stop there. It continues to, to, to mob your thought processes and others around you as you move through life. Uh, so that's uh, back in 1968. That's what happened to me. It kept moving. But thank God I had a, a backing of understanding uh, through my family, through my uh, a belief experience that, that you don't do something and wish you can change it. You must think about the changing before you do it. Simply said that uh, it's almost like a, a, a reliving an experience that you've already gone through or self-imaging, as I did in 1968 in that race because I had that pull uh, groin left leg muscle. You, you know, I could not warm up with the rest of the athletes, so I stood there and watched them, which was a crippling experience of uh, 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 mind with the mind process of seeing athletes as good as I was, some better, warming up, and I couldn't, although I was a world record holder, but I had to maintain uh, my uh, 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 stability in believing what I had to do will be done. So how would I do that? I mean, think, think, think. See yourself before you have to really do the action or practice before you do your action as the other athletes are doing on the field, but you got to do it on the inside of you. Uh, riders, right. I'm sure David had, uh, had gone through moments that wait, he yeah. had to wait a minute till his mind finished doing what he's going to put on paper, then he put it on paper, then he can talk about it. So the athletes right. are, that are in uh, Tokyo right now, I'm sure they're going through a mind, uh, a physical experience of believing right. what they're saying they have to yeah uh we're way over time um but you were only 24 when you displayed that incredible amount of courage so i just want to say my fist is in the air with you in 2021 just like you split your fist in the air for us in 1968 thank you so much for